To understand the world around us, scientists build models. Uh, and so when you see the word model in, in this class, what it means is kind of a, a structure for ideas that are all tied together to explain something. Uh, and in this first model that we're going to talk about, the geocentric model, is for explaining how the universe is organized. Geocentric means centered around the Earth, and so in, in this model, the Earth is the center of the universe. The geocentric model was developed by early astronomers we know now this isn't true. Uh, the Earth is not at the center of the universe. But it's still useful to think that way because as we view things in space, in our sky, uh, we are at the center. We are at that center from that perspective. Uh, so even though we are not the center of the universe, we can still use a lot of the ideas developed for the geocentric model. So let's take a look at the image at the bottom here. We have a person standing on the ground. Their horizon is the line uh, parallel to the ground as far as they can see. And their zenith is the point directly overhead. This bubble around them we call the celestial sphere. So it's an imaginary bubble that surrounds you. Your zenith is particular to you and where you are standing on the Earth. It's always your point directly overhead. Now if we look at the picture over here, this is illustrating uh, sort of in three-dimensional space this same view. So we have a person, this is supposed to be a person, standing on the Earth. Their zenith is directly overhead. Their horizon is this line here. And they're standing at a sort of random place on the Earth. So the Earth's axis is directed this way. Now depending on where they're standing, their zenith and their horizon moves, what they can see in space changes. So on this celestial sphere bubble, you can imagine all of the stars and planets uh, existing somewhere. And so where you move, when you move along the Earth, what you can see changes. And also over the course of a day, because the Earth is rotating, your sky changes. Now it's not hard to imagine why the early astronomers would believe that the Earth was at the center. And I think there's two primary reasons. It doesn't feel like we're moving, and so it makes sense that if we're not moving then everything else is. And when you watch how the things move, they make these arcs and circles around us. So it becomes sort of obvious that things are orbiting around the Earth. Uh, now, in the picture over here on the right, you can see that some of the stars are making complete circles in the sky. So this is a time lapse over a day. And the streaks are stars. Uh, the center of this circle is the North Star. It stays put. Because that star is where the Earth's axis points. So the sky is orbiting around, or rotating around that point in, in the sky. But some of the stars do go below the horizon, so like this streak of light here, it rises in the horizon and then eventually falls back into the horizon. But some stars make complete circles and we call those stars circumpolar. Now I mentioned before that where you are in the Earth changes what the sky looks like. Now here are three special locations on the Earth, the North Pole, the Equator, and an intermediate latitude. So at the North Pole, if you're standing at the North Pole and you look up, the zenith is actually the North Celestial Pole, which is the, the North Star. But that's only true at the North Pole. It's only true at the North Pole that your zenith is the North Star. But when you're at the North Pole, all of the stars are circumpolar, because they're all going around like this in circles. So everywhere above your horizon, remember the red line here is the horizon, everywhere above your horizon the stars are making circles in your sky. On the other hand, at the equator, your zenith at the equator is up here, the north celestial pole, the, the uh, north star is this direction, and so none of the stars are circumpolar. They're all making circles like this in the sky. 
And so they rise above the horizon and then set below the horizon every day. And then when you're at an intermediate lat latitude, some stars are circumpolar and some stars are not. Right? The stars that are illustrated here, those are circumpolar because they stay above your horizon. Uh, but a star that would be on like this path would, would rise above the horizon and then set eventually below it. So where you are determines whether stars are circumpolar and when and where they rise and set. Now it doesn't just change over a day, it also changes over the course of the year because the Earth is in orbit around the Sun, or if you prefer the geocentric perspective, the Sun is moving around us. Because of this, our perspective on the stars changes. Different constellations become visible, different constellations become not visible anymore. Um, and over the course of the year, the Sun passes through or passes in front of 12 different constellations. Technically, there's 13. Uh, just quickly, there's a 13th constellation here. Um, it's not part of the traditional zodiac, and so we usually don't talk about it. Um, but there are 13 constellations that the sun will pass in front of over the course of a year. But usually what happens is Scorpius and Sagittarius are given a little bit of extra space, and Ophiuchus is, is sort of wedged out. Uh, when I say it moves in front of, what I mean is, let's say you're here, right, in June, and you look towards the direction of the sun, the sun would be blocking Taurus, and so you would not see that constellation. So every, every uh, essentially month, and this is where months come from, uh, the sun is in front of a different constellation. And these 12 constellations, when you eliminate this one, are called the zodiac. And the line that intersects them all and that the sun will pass through over the course of a year is called the ecliptic. Um, and just one more point on this before moving on. Uh, if you're interested in astrology, the your astrological sign is the constellation that the sun was within at the moment of your birth. Now, these constellations have sort of drifted over time, and if you're interested, you can ask me about it, and I'll explain it a little bit further. Um, so technically, the standard astrological signs are not correct. If you're going by the sign is the constellation that, your sun, that the sun was in at the moment of your birth, uh, but that depends on how you view these sorts of things. Okay, now there's a lot of complexity to how the sky looks. And one of the principal reasons for that is that the Earth is tilted. Now it adds complexity, but it's also really important because that's what gives us seasons. The fact that the Earth is tilted means our angle at the sun changes. And so during the summer in the north, the North Pole is tilted towards the sun. And so the sun is higher in the sky, right? The sun, the angle of the sun is higher in the sky. Uh, there are two particular times of year when the, when the earth is tilted most towards the sun and most far away from the sun. These are known as the summer and winter solstices, and the, they're the longest and shortest days of the year. There are also two other important days um, in March and September where there's exactly an equal amount of day and day and night, uh, 12 hours of day, 12 hours of night, and those are called the equinoxes, the spring and fall equinoxes. But just to, to, to recap this, um, seasons are caused by this tilt. If we didn't have a tilted planet, if the Earth's axis was not tilted, the seasons would not exist. So just imagine taking this axis and tilting it straight up, then our angle on the sun would never change over the course of a year. So it wouldn't be higher in the sky at any point in the year. Higher in the sky means the light is more intense and also the days are longer. And if the earth wasn't tilted, the days would all be the same. And so there would be no changes over the course of a year, no seasons. Oops.
Okay, so we've talked about the zodiac constellations, uh, but there are many others. Uh, you've you've probably noticed Orion in the sky. If you haven't, you definitely will uh, at some point this semester. There are 88 official constellations, but I do want to mention that they're different for different cultures. And you'll get to know the program called Stellarium, which is an observation tool. Uh, and in that, you can actually change the constellation names to be any of a number of, con of different cultures. And I think it's interesting to do that, to notice that these patterns that we have for the sky are, are very human, right? There's really not much science that goes into the constellations. It's, it's much more uh, of an art and reflection of the people who, who put those pictures up there. Uh, one, one other point I want to make about constellations, because this is often misunderstood, is that the fact that these stars are all in the same grouping, right? So we have all these stars here that are part of Orion, doesn't necessarily mean that those stars are anywhere near one another in space. They're in roughly the same direction from the Earth, but this star might be much, much closer to us than this star, or vice versa. Right, so we're not able to perceive the depth of the stars just by looking at them. And the fact that they're in a constellation is just a, a human creation, a, a human pattern recognition. Now, throughout history, early astronomers were able to figure out a tremendous amount just using their naked eye and their mathematical abilities. And one of the, the tools at their disposal was geometry. And it's helpful to think about the geometry of light coming from things like the sun and other stars. And when you do that, you realize that they're so far away that the light essentially comes in parallel. So what this diagram is showing is that if you had something at, obj at point A or B or C, the light seems to emanate from that point. The rays of light would come in that direction and that direction. And so as the point gets farther away, the lines get more and more parallel, closer to parallel. And when you put something really, really far away, like off the screen far away, the light, it, you can just assume that it's parallel. And so we can do that for things like the sun they're far enough away that we can treat all the light rays as coming in parallel to us. Now that's helpful for figuring things out. And I want to show one example of that. This was done by one of the, the Greeks, Eratosthenes. He used these parallel rays of sunlight to determine the size of the Earth. And he did this in a sort of ingenious way. I've always really liked this, this um, kind of experiment that he did. He started out with knowing that on the summer solstice, the sun was directly overhead at a town called Cyan, or a city. It might have been a, I don't know if it was, I think it was a city. We'll go with that. Um, but on the summer solstice, the sun was directly overhead. And that means if you went to a well, the light would actually hit the bottom of the well, right? That's showing that the sun was directly overhead. It was at the zenith. And all the light would go to the bottom of the well because those light, the light was coming in parallel. But in Alexandria, which was where Eratosthenes was the head librarian at uh, Alexandria, uh, the sun was not directly overhead on that day. And so he knew he could measure the angle that the sunlight was coming in. Again, all the sunlight's coming in parallel lines, so he could determine the angle from the sunlight to the, his zenith in Alexandria. Now, his zenith, directly overhead, if you follow that line down, you'll eventually reach the center of the Earth, where it would intersect the, the line for the zenith in Cyan, right? They'd eventually intersect at the center of the Earth. And then here's where the math comes in. The angle here between these two, two towns or cities is the same relative size as this distance is 
when you compare it to the Earth itself. So he set up an equation, a mathematical ratio, that the angle he measured for the sunlight in Alexandria divided by 360 degrees, so this angle out of the whole circle, was equal to the ratio of this distance, which he measured in a unit called stadia, like the size of a stadium, uh, relative to the circumference of the Earth. So he could measure this, he could measure this, and calculate the circumference of the Earth, and it actually worked really, really well. The ancient Greeks used lots of different tricks like this, taking astronomical measurements, combining them with geometry and trigonometry, to, and looking at ratios, to calculate things like how big the Earth was, how far away the Sun was, how far away the Moon was. They were able to figure these things out with relatively good precision, uh, all with naked eye observations. Now the sky that we see today is mostly the same as it was for those early astronomers 2,000 plus years ago. But there are some differences, uh, and I wanted to mention one of them. Uh, since we talked about the Earth's tilt and the fact that it was tilted in such a way that the North Pole points to the star Polaris, the North Star. That was true 2,000 years ago, but it wouldn't have been true 13,000 years ago. The Earth has a slight wobble to it, and it's sort of like a spinning top on a table where it will keep spinning, but where it's pointing will sort of wobble around. That will also happen with, Earth, with Earth's axis. And so Polaris will be the North Star for, for a time, but it takes about 26,000 years for the Earth to wobble around once, and so 13,000 years, halfway, it will be pointed in a completely different direction. And in fact, that will be pointed toward the star Vega. And so Vega will be the North Star, and 13,000 years, 13, years ago, it was the North Star. But for our lives and probably everyone's lives who matters to us, uh, we can call Polaris the North Star. All right, so this geocentric model has been very helpful. People could understand what they're seeing and use it to, to mark the passage of time, help them plant crops, tell stories. It was sort of like their television uh, and that's where the ideas of constellations came from. But it's also sort of a nice philosophical idea. We're at the center of the universe and everything revolves around us. But we know today that it wasn't correct, and so it wasn't a perfect fit to the observations. One of the things that was hard to fit to the observations were these seven objects, Sun, Moon, Mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn. They all moved along the ecliptic line, but there was a difference between how they were moving than compared to all the fixed stars. They wandered. Their order changed. They passed one another in their orbits. At some points, they were actually moving backwards along the ecliptic line. And so there needed to be an explanation for what these were. The Greeks called them the wandering stars, the seven wandering stars. This is the, the source of our seven-day week. Each, each day of the week is for one of the wandering stars. The word for wandering stars in, in Greek was uh, planetes, and so that's where the word planets come from. And so originally the moon and the sun were two of these seven planets, seven known planets. So for the geocentric model to persist, they needed to explain the motion of the planets. And in about the year 140 AD, Ptolemy uh, created a version of the geocentric model to explain this. Um, it was very complex. So in order to, to, to make it all work, um, he had all of the planets moving in circles, but those circles were sort of offset from the Earth as the center. and on top of those circles, they were spinning around other circles, which he called epicycles. But with that, he was able to, and giving each planet an individual offset and an individual epicycle, he was able to make it work. Um, and there was this explanation for the planets. 
He could even explain a really strange behavior, which I alluded to in the previous slide, which is called retrograde motion, where the planet moves backwards in the sky relative to the fixed stars. All of that could be accounted for. And so Ptolemy's geocentric model prevailed um, for both the Christian and Muslim world uh, until around 1600 AD. So you can say that this picture, the Ptolemaic geocentric model, was the longest standing model, scientific model, um, in history, right? It lasted for um, almost 1,400 years. Our current picture of the universe has been around comparatively for only about a third of that time. So we have a long way to go uh, to match the, the duration of the, the geocentric model for humanity's understanding of, of their place in the universe. And we'll move on to the replacement for the geocentric model next.